Good afternoon and um, thank you Peter for the introduction and also to ASPE for the, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to sponsor this lunch. Now as today's sponsor, before I introduce David, I thought I'd take, uh, take the opportunity to bring you up to date on where Saab is, a little bit about our history and, uh, and where we're going now into the future. Saab's had a, quite a long engagement with the ADF. Uh, we're engaged from World War II. We're putting the uh, Bofors guns on the uh, naval warships there. In the late 60s, the Army began using a Carl Gustav uh, recallless rifle, which saw service in Vietnam and is still in operations today. Our first company was actually established here some 30 years ago with Saab Barracuda, a uh, Army camouflage uh, net producing company, which we've uh, been doing and delivering to the, to the Australian Army since. In the late 80s, the uh, RBS-70 missile system was uh, delivered to the now air land regiment based in Woodside and which also saw service on naval vessels in the uh, Persian Gulf conflict. In 1988 we signed the Anzac ship project and we ramped that up to deliver Swedish technology in terms of the combat management system here in Australia. Now that was our biggest project and that was really saw the establishment of our headquarters in Mawson Lakes in, in Adelaide. Today we have two production companies based in Adelaide we are in six locations or states and territories around Australia and in New Zealand. We have over 300 people and we're delivering not only to defence but also into the, the civil market as well, into prisons and also to uh, now re quite recently into air traffic management. In regards to today's topic, not, people, not many people would realise that we've actually been involved with the Collins class submarine for quite some time. So we provided the integrated ship control movement and management system, and what commonly known as ISCOMS, uh, we began developing that in the late 1980s for Collins class. Some of the platform systems monitor, uh, monitored by ISCOMS include the steering, the batteries, fire and gas detection systems, fuel supply, cooling, refrigeration, trim and weight, and hydraulics. ISCOMS has proved to be quite a reliable system. It's performed exceptionally well with a minimal intervention over the time with only minor software updates as a result of platform changes and obsolescence generated change. You may have recently seen in the press that we're working with our customers to initiate work on an obsolescence remediation program that will uh, ensure ISCOMS continues. Our guest speaker today, Mr David Gould, he joined the DMO in July last year as the General Manager of Submarines. His responsibility was, is basically all material related aspects of the submarine support across defence. He has an extensive experience in acquisition projects and has worked across numerous platforms, including the UK Aircraft Carrier Program, the Type 45 destroyers and the astute class nuclear powered submarines. He's also been involved in restructuring the United Kingdom's warship, guided weapons and helicopter industries. David had a, an interesting start to his career, actually studying at the uh, School of European Studies at the University of Sussex, and his first job was as a teacher in Sicily. I'm not sure how he then moved across to the MOD, but he did in 1973, and is a graduate of the, the NATO Defence College in Rome. He's held numerous appointments during his time, the Under Secretary of Supply and Organisation with the Air Force, Under Secretary of Policy with the Ministry of Defence, Under Secretary Fleet Support, and in 2000, he was appointed the Deputy Chief of the Defence Procurement Agency and in 2004 added the role of Chief Operating Officer to that. David retired from the Ministry of Defence in 2008 and set up his own consultancy business and was the Executive Chairman of Celex SI Limited. On a personal front, he speaks fluent French and Italian, is a keen angler or fisherman, is a member of the Morgan Sports Car Club and I note a uh, a passionate rugby supporter, although I'm pretty sure he won't be backing for the same team that I will be on Saturday. <laughs> I'm sure you, that uh, you'll agree that David is eminently qualified to pull together the remediation and support of our existing fleet and a future submarine project. Please join me in welcoming Mr David Gould. Thank you, Dean. Um, I'll be supporting Wales for the first time in my life. <laughs> Almost. Um, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and um, 
I'm grateful to Ashby and to Saab for uh, hosting this event and giving me the opportunity to draw together my thoughts and observations after almost a year in the job, so it's uh, sort of opposite time in a way. Um, <coughs> if, can you all hear me at the back? Is it okay? Yep, good. Um, right, well, submarines have developed over the generations and years from being commerce raiders and spending most of their lives on the surface to becoming major anti-surface, anti-submarine and strategic intelligence assets, spending most of their lives beneath the surface able to control or inhibit the use of sea space by potential adversaries and operate undetected in areas denied to other vessels and aircraft. The range of types of operation submarines are required to undertake has grown and that will continue. And all of that has had a profound effect on submarine design. As Chief of Navy has said previously, when Australia embarked on its first national submarine program, it didn't wade in at the shallow end of the pool, it jumped straight in to the deep end. And seen in that context, the design and build of the Collins class was an extraordinary achievement for Australia. The project delivered a class of six submarines of unique design in a shade under 20 years. To put that in perspective, the UK's astute class program has so far commissioned two boats, I think, um, and since approval of the design and build contract in 1996, and it will very comfortably exceed 20 years to complete all seven of the class. And that has little or nothing to do with the incorporation of a nuclear reactor. So, interesting comparison there. Some features of Collins were groundbreaking at the time. The control and management monitoring system has already been mentioned by Dean, but I saw for myself recently during 24 hours on board HMS Sheehan, the maneuvering control console which was certainly well ahead of anything we had on the Swiftshore class at the equivalent time in the UK. And Collins remains unique among diesel electric submarines in its capability to undertake long range and long endurance, mission, long endurance missions, which is an essential capability in an Australian submarine. Yes, there were some choices made in the later stages of design that were, with the benefit of hindsight, poor, and some of those had consequences which we are still correcting today. But on the whole, the, the submarines were competently designed, as confirmed by John Coles in his report and by the recent Service Life Evaluation Project, and they operated reasonably well for the early part of their lives. But towards the end of the last decade, it was clear that something was badly wrong in terms of intolerably low levels of submarine availability. And that led to the appointment of Mr. John Coles to conduct his study into Collins sustainment. That was welcome recognition that help was needed. John Coles and I had worked with us together in the Chief of Fleet Sports Area of the Royal Navy in the mid-1990s when the UK had similar problems with the availability of its attack submarine fleet and although some of those related to nuclear safety and regulation, the underlying causes arose from deeper managerial and cultural causes. That helps demonstrate that the problems with submarine sustainment are not confined to Australia nor indeed to Australia and the United Kingdom, for that matter. John Coles' report um, traced the problem to five root causes, and it's worth recalling what they are because they are fundamentally managerial and not technical. First cause, operational requirements not defined in a way that can effectively be translated into sustainment activities. Lack of a performance-based ethos across the enterprise, unclear lines of responsibility, poor planning, and lack of a single set of information to inform decision taking. One of Coles' major achievements was to cut through the fog of speculation about whether and why Collins performed badly and establish through research and detailed analysis that the fleet's performance fell well below what should be expected when compared to the average performance across a group of allied navies, which we refer to now as benchmark performance and further to establish that this was not a function of poor design, nor of poor operation by crews, but of wholly inadequate maintenance arrangements having been put in place, or rather not put in place. Once these conclusions were accepted, we could focus on fixing the problem as opposed <coughs> to arguing about it, although some elements of the fix, such as the establishments of clear requirements, the in-service support contract, and the restoration of the platform spares inventory 
did not need to await the final report from John Coles. Informed by the benchmarking, Coles was able to set a reasonable expectation of availability from the fleet, which the Navy could translate into an achievable requirement that would then drive the shape and conduct of the usage and upkeep cycle. This requirement can be summarized as three submarines always available to the fleet commander for tasking, with a fourth sometimes available or in shorter term maintenance. Achieving benchmark performance described in that way requires a fundamental redesign of the usage and upkeep cycle, such that each boat spends two years only, as compared to three or more now in full cycle docking, 10 years in operation, with a shorter mid-cycle docking after five years of operation. The key aspect here is the ratio rather than the actual time frames. And simple arithmetic tells you that to achieve this, only one boat can be in full cycle docking at any one time. So that adds up to a rallying point around which the submarine enterprise in Australia is now focusing, which I describe as delivering required capability at benchmark availability. Perhaps not the most catchy phrase, but it's one that we all understand and can plan our work around. And we do that through reducing the time loss to defects, that's better reliability, reducing overruns in planned maintenance, and reducing the time in planned maintenance as well. But why do we talk about an enterprise, and who is it? The who in its broadest sense is anyone in the submarine business in Australia, but at the operational level today it is Navy, DMO, the Australian Submarine Corporation, and the ASC ZONA, the Department of Finance and Deregulation. <coughs> the why is at the heart of what ca characterises the submarine business. It's very technical, it's very complex, it's very specialised and therefore beset by a scarcity of qualified and experienced resource and has high levels of integration and interdependence. As a result, no single component of the enterprise can be fully accountable for delivery. Effective and efficient delivery depends on good planning and execution, which in turn require alignment and collaboration across the enterprise, a common performance-driven culture, shared use of processes and data, and clear allocation of responsibility for management of activity across the cycle. In other words, we only win if we all win. To illustrate, collaborative planning needs input on required submarine availability for training and operations, engineering judgment on the content of maintenance to ensure technical safety and safety certification on completion, planning the incorporation of upgrades, and managing industrial resource loading. Exercising engineering judgment in planning maintenance is in itself highly dependent on skilled analysis of accurate, accurately recorded usage data. For example, to understand the trade-off for a component between increasing maintenance time to reduce the reliability risk or reducing maintenance time to tolerate a higher risk of a defect arising, understanding its consequence in overall availability, and enabling prompt rectification. Either answer can be correct, depending on the overall availability outcome, but noting that safety will never be compromised. Allowing the ASC freedom of action to perform as the primary maintainer for Collins requires the ASC's engineers to exercise this judgment, not the DMO or the Navy's engineers. And for ASC to do so in a manner that gives both DMO and Navy comfort as to the integrity of ASC's engineering decision making means that individual ASC engineers need to be authorised by Navy to operate within the Collins class authorised engineering organisation at the appropriate level. And a significant step in the implementation of this departure from previous practice occurred this month with the award of level two engineering to members of the ASC's or to <coughs> ASC engineers, and this happened last week. Level 2 is the highest authorization held outside the head Navy, naval engineers direct remit and represents, represents a significant empowerment of the ASC. But while the maintenance plan is engineering led, production schedules must be capable of completion in the required timescales. And this too demands significant innovation. For example, the reintroduction of hull cuts to improve access and removal of machinery for overhaul and the use of maintenance towers to improve productivity on the boat while maintenance activities underway. Engineering empowerment and maintenance reforms will not deliver if they themselves are not underpinned by broader sustainment reforms and focused by a common purpose. 
Examples of reforms in these areas that have been completed since the release of Cole's report include the following. Responsibility for management of all Collins platform inventory spares was incorporated into the in-service support contract in March this year. Responsibility for management of all combat system inventory was incorporated into our arrangements with Raytheon Australia last week. This means that 96% of all Collins inventory is managed now by industry on our behalf. These reforms will continue when by this time next year we aim to be at 99%. The inventory reforms have led to a change in inventory management culture. Instead of managing inventory levels, stock is now managed to conduct work, particularly in the ASC. This has seen a dramatic increase in a metric, which I will bore you with, which we call work pack fill rate, that's to say stores held to conduct a task, from around 50% in the past to consistent performance now above 97%. Having stores consistently and predictably available has enabled much tighter control over the schedule maintenance, or the, the over schedule maintenance activities. This was borne out recently in a certification extension docking in HMAS Farncombe, which completed at the end of May. Historically, Collins class maintenance periods have overrun, almost always, but Farncombe's completion date was set and agreed in September 2012, and the date was achieved on time. The introduction of incentivized performance directives uh, performance metrics directly linked to submarine availability has been another key reform. The reform was implemented, implemented in the ISSC in March this year and we intend to propose similar arrangements for our other key industry partners during the coming year. That is to say payments directly linked to the availability of the submarines as part of the contract. And finally we have implemented reforms as recommended by John Coles to commercially empower ASC such that where traditionally budget for undefined or emergent work was held by the Commonwealth and approved on a case-by-case -case basis by the DMO is now effectively managed on our behalf by the ASC, which saves considerable amounts of time. In essence, commercial freedom combined with engineering authority empowers industry to execute business at the task level and elevates the Commonwealth from a task level manager to focus on outputs and outcomes. That means the role of the DMO is changing to assuring itself and the Navy that the planning and execution by ASC and other contractors will produce the required outcome. In other words, assuring that there is alignment between the material sustainment agreement between the DMO and the Navy and the contract, the ISSC and others, between DMO and ASC. A focus again on the outcome, not the input, sometimes described as hands on, eyes on and hands off. These are challenging behavioural changes for all concerned and require new skills and new understanding and careful and determined management to embed. So is it working? Well obviously there are some significant risks and we shall not meet benchmark availability until 2016-17. We have to get there progressively. After 2016-17, there will only be one boat in FCD at a time. But we have a fast maturing and a detailed plan to get us there. And a powerful factor is that this is the ASC's plan, albeit developed in full cooperation with DMO and Navy, and it is their plan to implement. This brings the ASC and their owner fully into alignment with the joint enterprise objective in that the plan was driven by the Navy's availability requirement as informed by John Coles's work and not developed in isolation from a purely industrial loading aspect. Second factor is that the CEO of the ASC and I jointly review this plan in the presence of Navy, ASC and Department of Finance staff every quarter. Quite apart from the assurance this provides, I believe it sets a very strong example of what is expected of enterprise behaviour. In terms of Collins' availability, there have been significant recent improvements. Over much of 2013, we have had, and will largely keep, three submarines available to the fleet commander. This demonstrates that Coles' expectation of performance is practical and achievable if there are sufficient assets available. Over the last financial year, we have exceeded the Navy's interim target for material ready days by 20%, 
which amounts to a 50% increase in availability over the previous year, noting that that target grows towards benchmark levels over the coming years. We don't get there immediately. These are encouraging signs, but they're no more than that. Because of a significant volume of planned maintenance to be undertaken before 2016-17, we shall need to continue to do better on reliability to match this year's performance. And there will be fluctuations in submarine numbers along the way until we get to the, the aiming point. That's Collins, C-1000. <coughs> so before getting into the extent to which the enterprise model would apply to C-1000, I'll give a very brief update on where we are. As announced at the time of the last white paper, the Submarine Propulsion Energy Support and Integration Facility mouthful, has gone through first pass and the joint DMO, DSTO and industry team have started work on capability definition, operational concept, function and performance specification and an early test plan. Clearly the inputs from the option three and option four concept designs will be important elements to that work and we expect these to begin to clarify around this time next year. As announced, we have reached agreement on intellectual property rights with the Government of Sweden, which are sufficient for us to undertake concept work on an evolved Collins Option 3 with TKMS AB, or Kokums as was, and we are now in negotiation with the company on scope of work and ensuring that the contract appropriately recognises the IP rights agreed with the Swedish Government. We don't anticipate any difficulty there because they're hungry to do the work. We have, however, made clear to both that to go beyond concept design, we shall require a more permissive and enduring regime of IP rights. The scope of work will require TKMS to correct known deficiencies with the Collins design and propose improvements, but will not allow them to increase the diameter of the pressure hull. To do so would clearly cross the threshold into a new design. We should also require them to do significant work in Australia as part of building up our own design capability. The Option 4 team is now building up in Adelaide and has started work. Previous studies, including those by the RAND Corporation, have indicated that in large part there is sufficient skill and knowledge in Australia to undertake our own concept design, albeit with some help from overseas. This allows us to develop our own understanding of the cost and capability trade-offs without making an early commitment to a design partner. We shall subsequently need assistance to build design capability in Australia, but this leaves us free to choose the partner that best suits our needs, not least in respect of willingness to transfer knowledge and expertise into Australia. Also, we have begun work with the US Navy to establish how they can work to provide advice on the quality and soundness of our work, but not underwrite our work, importantly, and assist with the adaptation of the US-Australian combat system and main armament to a new design. So what is the, what, to what degree does the enterprise approach apply to C-1000 as well as to Collins? It's clear to me that it's quite critical to success. We must not repeat one of the fundamental errors of Collins, which was to allow the designer and key parts of the team that built the ships to split away from the project early in the class's operational life. This left the maintainer with little knowledge of the underlying, underlying design philosophy, and such knowledge as there was, was rapidly dissipated. On the contrary, both the builder and the maintainer must be involved with the designer from early on. The guiding principle should be support the design and design the support, one of the key lessons learned from the Collins experience. Further, the technical and specialist demands of design and of fabrication and build are even more stringent and scarce than for maintenance. And this is a worldwide phenomenon. So if Australia is to become the parent nation of its submarines, we shall have to allocate the scarce resource, much of it still has to be created, with great, clear, with great care. We must be clear about the difference between technical authority and the role of the industrial designer and design authority, that is the deciding role, which is the role of the Commonwealth, who will ultimately need to own the design and control its future evolution. There will not be sufficient resource to duplicate and overlap such skills, and people will have to learn to be comfortable about moving around and across organizations as roles develop. Core elements of a cohesive enterprise which we've developed for the Collins transformation are the following. 
that we're focused on the same endpoint, we're structured and incentivized to deliver, we have the right leaders and the right people, and we work collaboratively to achieve common enterprise goals. These are equally applicable to future submarine, although as the program moves on, some component parts will change and new ones will need to be added. What characterizes submarine nations is learning from and building on experience. Submarine capability at the top level depends on the creation and preservation of critical long-term knowledge from design through to operation and indeed disposal. Australia did not exploit the Collins opportunity in this respect. We are now retrofitting the learning model into sustainment. To complete the journey, we have to refresh that capability in respect of design and build as part of C1000. To return to my opening point, submarines at today's demanding levels of capability are not commodities, but bespoke designs to meet the user's strategic operational needs. Designs are evolutionary in the sense that a nation builds on experience to create a set of technical standards and design rules that apply across the generations of evolving design. Sometimes the evolutionary step can be relatively short. I remember the slogan, nothing on Trafalgar that hasn't been on Swiftshore. And sometimes it needs to be larger to encompass a greater capability or technological increment, such as Trafalgar to a suit, even if that was partly accidental, but it worked in the end. The work we have now put in hand will rigorously test whether an evolved design based on Collins can meet the Australian strategic requirement and provide the basis of critical knowledge through the future submarine life, or whether a bigger step is indicated. Either way, the creation of a long-term body of knowledge to underpin the future will be essential to an enduring and potent submarine capability for Australia. Thank you. Yeah, questions Sorry. now or? Just to notice, all we can learn from the agency of defence or water. Can I take it through uh, your comments about C-1000, the US combat system and US weapons have already been mandated for the future class of submarines? Uh, no, you can't. Um, they are, um, <coughs> we are using the elements of the US combat system which are jointly developed by Australia and the United, and the United States as information to the two concept design teams, that they must build a design or they must do their concept design using the power, weight, etc. Uh, requirements of that combat system. We have not committed ourselves um, irrevocably to the US combat system at this stage. More questions? Uh, Max, is it? I think down the end and then we'll come to uh, Catherine. Max Lee from Australian Associated Press, so it's a book. I'm just wondering, are you firming up on costs at all? Um, I, I think one of the, that's the analysis suggested a peak of about $40 billion, uh, breathtaking amount of money, is it coming down? Um, it's not coming down because it's not my estimate. Um, I find it very difficult to estimate the cost of a submarine that's not yet been designed. Um, so part of what we have to do in the concept designs is start building up a picture and understanding of what those costs might be. Um, it's not just the cost of building a submarine, it's the cost of the investment that you have to make to be able to assemble a submarine in, uh, in Australia. Uh, but that is something that we will build up over time and we'll have a better feel for it in about 18 months time, but the figures that have been quoted, the 36 billion, the 40 billion, are nothing to do with me, and they're certainly not anything that I underwrite. <coughs> uh, Catherine. Thank you, Mr. Gould. Catherine Zeese from Australian Defence Magazine. Um, with all the troubles that our sovereign classes have had over the last few years, do you believe there is a political will up in Brussels to move forward with such an expensive program? given the uh, new financial times that we face? Um, I, can, I can only talk about what I have um, experienced in the year I've been here. Uh, and there has been not so much as a political will in Russell, there's a political will over there to do this. Uh, and what I have um, <coughs> had is uh, nothing but encouragement and commitment from over there to, to get this right. Um, so, as things stand today, uh, yes, I do think there's political will to do it. From both sides of the house? 
I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't worked for the other side of the house, so I, I can't tell you. Um, I, can, I can guess by trying to interpret things that people say from time to time, but what I hear is, um, as we have not been, as this is from the opposition side, as we have not been involved, we don't really understand all the, all the questions to ask and certainly don't understand all the answers. So I take it that means an open mind. At David, least. can I, oh, sorry, yeah, I, was, I was going to uh, exercise the moderator's right to ask a question myself, and it, 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 it is about your year of living dangerously in, in the ACT. Um, um, you know, our systems are, uh, are very similar, um, so similar mm -hmm. that outsiders might not understand that there are also some quite big differences in terms of how policy is made and, and how um, departments uh, interact with governments. I just wonder if you've got any thoughts about what, what are the points of difference and the points of similarity between your UK experience and your Australian experience that, that sort of come to your mind after okay. 12 months of being here? Um, okay, the similarities first. Um, I find working with the Royal Australian Navy very similar to working with the Royal Navy. Differences in size may be, but the, the culture seems to me very similar. Uh, so far as um, working in Russell is concerned, um, the, the, the DMO is sort of structured like the DENS in the UK, uh, but that's about as far as it goes. So actually, I've found the differences much more remarkable than the similarities. Um, hard to explain. I think the um, and. and Word of warning, I haven't, I haven't worked in the UK <coughs> Ministry of Defence for four years, so it's probably quite different now to what it was when I left it. Um, the Australian system is much more centralised. There is much less delegation. Um, there is much, much more regulation. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, in the UK, we don't have a Financial Management Act. We don't, we don't have a legal framework to regulate the way in which government money is spent. There's a lot of custom and practice, and there is also the, there is there is always the law about fraud and behaviour and so forth. But we don't have that kind of depth of regulation. Um, I used to think that um, the uh, UK's standard conditions in terms of contract were pretty onerous, and used to try and sort of set fire to them every now and again and get rid of some. Um, I'm just looking through a proposed contract that we were about to send out to a supplier the other day, and I thought, my God. If I received that as a European supplier, <coughs> trying to get into the Australian market, I would have said, don't bother, not worth it, too onerous. Um, and the other thing, the thing which I found most puzzling, well, I'm getting used to it now, when I got here, was over here we have defence, and over there we have government. In the UK, in the Ministry of Defence, you are part of government. It's a completely different way of looking at it. So your Secretary of State, is down the corridor from you, and you, you drop by and do a drive-by shooting every now and again, um, or whatever. We I mean, do I don't mean that. What I mean, what I mean is you, you can drop in and just talk about things. Um, and the Secretary of State will take things to the NSC on behalf of the department. It's, it's, a, it's a different kind of way of looking at the relationship. Uh, so I've actually found, although superficially <coughs> the political administrative systems are similar, Actually, when you when you live in it, it's it's very different. Fascinating. Time for a few more questions. Oh, there's one over there. Sorry, Nick Stewart from the Canberra Times. Um, I understand exactly what you've been saying in, in terms of this, but I remember years ago listening to a very young King Weasley saying more or less exactly the same thing in terms of making sure that we were going to have the best uh, forms of uh, qualitative control and making sure that, that everything is going to be extremely robust. As an Australian taxpayer, I wonder whether or not we two questions. Firstly, the one that you probably can't answer, which is whether or not we genuinely require a submarine that will be able to uh, be, if necessary, larger than the Collins class, which would enable us to avoid the agreement with the Swedes. Uh, and secondly, whether or not there, there have 
um, do, do you ask us to simply trust on the basis of your assertions, which I think are, are undoubtedly more valid than, than my assertions, that we have actually learned something from the, the entire process that we've been through, right when we still, in future, are unlikely to have more than two submarines at, at sea for extended periods of time? Um, several questions there. Um, a, a submarine to meet the strategic requirement as set out in various white papers going back to 2009 is, in my view, very likely to be larger than Collins. <coughs> and the reason for that is that simply that you need to restore margins of buoyancy, power, uh, and, and so forth, and, and crew size. So everything will drive you into a larger uh, design. Uh, the fact, as I said earlier, that, that, that the range of roles that submarines are asked to undertake keeps growing means that you're going to need more, more space and power. So it will be, in my opinion, larger. How much larger? That's the work we're doing at the moment. How much design change do you have to make? That's the work we're undertaking. So I don't know the answer, but that's the direction of travel, for sure. Um, can we... Can we learn the lessons? It isn't just a question of learning the lessons from Australia's experience. What we have to do, and Australia is, is in a good place for this because people seem to like to come here, um, is we have to go around and um, not, not poach, but we have to look for where we can get experience from around the world, but particularly I think from the UK and the US, to actually help Australia so we benefit from the lessons that they have learned as well as the lessons that we have learned. So it isn't just learning from Collins, it's learning from as many places as you can. We in Australia will need help to do this because we don't have the capability as we sit here today to design and build a submarine. That has to be built as part of the project. Um, <coughs> can these projects be done well? Yes, they can. Um, can they go wrong? Yes, they can. Uh, it all depends on the skill, attention to detail, um, and in particular, I think one of the critical things with a project of this size is do you have consistency of purpose? If you keep, for whatever reason, changing your mind and changing direction, you inject unnecessary problems into the program. And I've seen that on a number of programs over the years, that if there isn't consistency of purpose and consistency of activity, that's when things start to go really badly wrong because you, 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 you impede the ability of your design and your manufacturer teams to, to, to build their capability in a consistent fashion. So a lot of this is not predetermined, but it is determined by the way in which um, it's as much about the will and the intent as it is about the technical capability to do something, that's all I'd say. David, I'll make this the last question for you. Oh, no, actually, I won't make it the last question. Uh, no, I've got to have a question from Admiral Love. <laughs> yes, and then I'll go to Rick. Rick, you'll be the last question. Uh, David, Bob Love from uh, Bangkok. Um, <laughs> you've done one year here now. Uh, I'd like you to wind forward two years. Yep. Uh, if we can, and, and do some crystal ball gazing. Where do you need to be in two years' time with C-1000? With C-1000? In two years' time, so summer of 2015. Sorry, European summer, winter 2015. <laughs> I'm already thinking, you see, I'm going back. <laughs> um, we need to have completed two concept designs. We need to have evaluated two concept designs. We need to have determined um, the rate and type of investment that needs to be made in subsequent design tools and design and build tools, manufacturing, manufacturing facilities. I think that by 2015 we will have to know what the propulsion system, at least for the first two or three boats, is going to be. Uh, so we'll have had to make progress on, on Specify. Um, and we will have needed to have a much better handle on the certainly the design and build stage of the program costs, um, but we will not have contract quality costs for build by any 
stretch of the imagination at that point. We may have good quality costings for the uh, system or preliminary design phase. We should have that. And that will enable government to make informed choices about the next three years or so. And three years is about as long as it should take to do the preliminary design, if we get on with it. So that's more or less where I think we ought to be. Rick. Thanks, uh, Peter. Uh, thank you, uh, Rick Smith. Yes. As one of the original implementers of uh, the Caned uh, uh, reforms, David, I'm very interested in what you yeah. had to say about the relationship between uh, uh, Navy and Cape Bellioma, uh, yourself as the uh, submarine program manager, and ASC. Uh, I always suspected as we implemented Caned that that relationship would evolve somewhat. You said something uh, very interesting about it, but I wonder if you're just taking back over that again. I wasn't quite clear where you said that's got to. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was speaking earlier about <coughs> the sustainment phase, uh, where what, what we now have is a, is a formal agreement between Navy and, and myself, DMO, about the Navy's requirement for availability and capability insertion into the current generation of submarines. My job is to make sure that that agreement actually um, is, is picked up and executed by the contractual agreement between DMO and the ASC and, and other suppliers. So that's really a sustainment phase activity. I think um, the, the sort of Kinnaird two-pass model for a project of this sort um, probably doesn't work. Um, you need several passes uh, to get there because you can really only, coming back to the question I was asking, how much is this going to cost? I cannot tell you that at the moment. I can tell you what the next phases are going to cost. So you take it phase by phase and say, we'll do this much work for that much money and then we'll have a bigger body of information that will take you into the next three or four year period and then a further body of information that will take you into the initial build phase. So you build up an understanding over time. You can't really do that with just two passes. I mean, you, you could if somebody gave you all the money and said, get on with it. But I don't think they will. I don't think they should. Uh, so I think what you, and this really comes from my UK experience, um, and I never really got, got it done the way I wanted, um, which was that for a project of this size and complexity, you actually want a series of passes or decisions which are taken relatively lightly so you don't, you know, the quality of the decision is not proportionate to the size of the pile of paper which supports it. It is, you know, it is, it's, it's how much do you need to know and how much do you need to spend to learn that to get you to the next stage that you can rationally get to and then move on. If you have very big decision points, what tends to happen is that the decision point becomes overburdened and people tend to focus on the wrong things because they're expecting too much. So... That was sort of one of my sort of parting recommendations to the DNS when I left. And I don't think it's been implemented. But um, I think that's the way you should approach these very big projects. Well, now I think we should call it a halt. Uh, David, can I thank you for your very thoughtful presentation, your very direct comments. Um, I think it's particularly valuable, actually, to have uh, someone with uh, the ability to bring some comparative mm -hmm. uh, experience to uh, to our, uh, our own circumstances here, and I, I really enjoyed your comments around that. Um, I also think that uh, with regard to what you said in a couple of the, the last questions, that it's entirely appropriate that I should ask you back 12 months from now to, uh, to give I us a report say two years. on <laughs> how you're going. Uh, but uh, can I ask you all to please thank uh, David.